A Life of Bliss. Being the biography of Bachelor Bliss with Brenda Bruce as Anne, Colin Gordon as Tony, Muriel Pablo as Tina, and George Cole as the shy young bachelor himself, David Alexander Bliss. Does Bliss consider there's any future in marriage by computer? This week's excuse to call on him a day or two ago. Oh, you mean fill in a questionnaire designed to reveal your basic character, feed it into a computer? And out would come the name of a possible wife. Well, out of the question from my point of view. Why? Well, feed in my character and out would come a rejection slip. <laughs> well, Sister Anne and husband Tony seem very happily married. Yes, but they were definitely B.C. B.C.? Before computer. <laughs> Talking about them doesn't embarrass you? Not in the least. So there you are. You won't trip me up that way. A united couple? Couldn't be more united. Yet they still retain their separate identities. That's the whole secret, if you ask me. And it's really true in that case. Oh, good heavens, yes. Tony may blow his top occasionally and do his nuts about being master in his house. But it doesn't amount to anything. When it comes down to it, he's got a genuine respect for Anne's mind. In other words, they're a well-balanced couple. Unusually well-balanced. Couldn't be better, in fact. David, old lad. Oh, hello, Tony. We were just talking about you. Oh, what were you saying? That you may blow up occasionally, but when it comes down to it, you've got nothing up top. <laughs> um, when it comes down to it, you're unusually unbalanced. No, no, no. You couldn't be more of a nutter. No. I left, leaving him to sort it out. Back to the present to join David and Anne for The Insecurity Guard. I wouldn't mind. Heaven knows I wouldn't mind. Only it happens, just happens to be the third time in a week Tina's put me off. Well, only because she's been working late interviewing people. I know that. And I know that working on a magazine, irregular hours are part of her job. I mean, I'm not stupid. There's overconfidence for you. <laughs> it shouldn't be necessary to put me off that often, Anne. Not if she's properly organized. Three interviews out of the blue inside a week. It doesn't make sense. Fact is, she falls for the atmosphere of glamour surrounding the people concerned. Now, I wouldn't want you to get the idea I'm jealous. I'll try not to. But the first time, it was a pop star. Male, needless to say. I'll go on trying not to, despite that. The other two times, that film star, Michael Crane, described in today's paper as having an animal appeal. It's no use. I failed not to. <laughs> well, you must know I trust Tina. Well, I know you've got every reason to trust her. And you don't think I've got any grounds for complaint? I can even prove it. Well, I'd like to know how. She's put you out three times in a week. That's what you said, isn't it? Yes. Yet you were out with her on Monday night. Okay, then. Three times in ten days. You were out with her last Thursday night, too. Well, three times in a fortnight, and that's my last offer. You also saw her over the weekend. Well, you drive a hard bargain. On Saturday evening and all day Sunday. Do you think I ought to see a psychiatrist and find out what's wrong with me? Not really. You don't think it's that serious? I think the shock might prove too much for you. <laughs> I do trust her, though. You remember that song with the title, Love is a Many Splendid Thing? Vaguely. Well, there could be a follow-up called Jealousy is a Many-Headed Monster. <laughs> for example? Oh, good gracious. Well, well, for example, fathers can be jealous of their own children. And children of each other. And of other children. Yes, and mums of other mums. You must have heard them. To hear Mrs. Worthington talk, you think that her Jeremy was going to grow up to be Prime Minister, and the closest he'll come to that is getting himself arrested outside number 10. Well, I'm sure you're far too sensible to feel the same about Alexander. What? That he'll ever become Prime Minister? Well, of course I don't think he will. Well, that's what I said. I know he will. <laughs> it's like so silly of all those other mums. People can be jealous about almost anything. Of other people's success. And possessions. As Tony will be about Clive Howard's new car. Well, I'll believe that when I hear it. You will, as soon as he hears about the car. And then there's just no end to it. People can even be jealous of a dog's affection. And a dog of not winning ours. <laughs> Whatever psyche trying to say. But she doesn't need to be jealous because everybody's mad about her. But you know, as often as not, and this applies in your case... Oh, I completely forgot when we were talking about me. Well, it springs from insecurity. Oh, nonsense. Why should I feel insecure about Tina? I ought to be sure of her by now. Well, how about being sure of yourself? To coin a phrase, that's an ass of a different colour. A prize ass, but normal enough. Normal? Completely. Do you know, that's the first time anybody's ever said that about me. <laughs> normal in this one respect. Well, you would have to spoil it. I'll make up for it by psychoanalyzing you. Oh, you qualify. Fully. And for an obvious reason. What? I've been married for 17 years. That counts? Well, it's only one of the many things a woman has to be. Meaning? Wife, mother, cook and housekeeper, chartered accountant, vital if you're going to manage on your housekeeping, nursemaid to your children, wet nurse to your husband, guide, <laughs> philosopher, vamp and psychiatrist. Say no more, I'll lie down on the couch. <laughs> Lacking confidence, you feel that you can't compete with the Michael Cranes of this world. Well, who could? He's not only got an animal appeal, you know, he's got an earthy sensuality, too. No, I can hardly match that, can I? Not unless yours is underground. <laughs> but 
You have got an appeal of your own. Animal? Household pet. <laughs> now, what's the matter with that? Jealous because you said I was a household pet. <laughs> the green-eyed monster strikes again. <laughs> yeah, not you, jealousy. Every bit as deadly as Frankenstein's monster. Yeah, except that Frankenstein was destroyed by his. Jealousy can destroy a man and turn him into a monster. It can? Dracula, Rasputin, Fu Manchu, and the Marquis de Sade rolled into one. Well, then you'd better get on with the psychoanalysis while there's still time. You're already on the turn. Remember what you said about Tina? That it shouldn't be necessary for her to put you off so often, not if... Not if she was properly organized. A snide remark, was it not? Oh, slightly snide. Knock, knock, in fact? I'll settle for tap, tap. I can control it now. It's later than you think. Yes. Well, I think you've cheered me up enough for one session. I'll settle for a few cooking hints instead. When are you seeing her next? Any minute now. I thought she cancelled your day because of an interview. Yes, but she said she'd pop in for a few minutes on her way to Mr. Crane and his animal sensuality. No, oh, for goodness sake, David. I'm surprised at you. Really, I am. The poor girl's obviously gone out of her way to consider your feelings and you behave like this. Now, you listen to me. I'm going to give you a solemn warning. Oh, no, you're sounding like a soothsayer. Well, then heed what I say because believe me, it's good sooth. When she arrives, don't even mention Michael Crane. Well, she'll probably mention him herself. Then change the subject, but not with a jerk. Smoothly. You better have something up your sleeve, ready. Well, I don't have to prepare anything, not with Tina. There's so much I can say about her. You can begin by saying how sweet it is of her to pop in at all. I know. A lot of my past girlfriends wouldn't have bothered. But then she's different from all the others. Altogether different. Different all round. Herself, in fact. A complete person. She's not just pretty or attractive either. She, she's got a sort of, it sounds corny, I know, but a, a sort of inner beauty. And it's reflected in her face. I forget which of his poems it comes from, but Keats once wrote, A thing of beauty is a joy forever. That's Tina for you. A joy forever. Do you know, I can be in my blackest mood, but when she walks in, it's like... Like what? Drawing back the curtains on a lovely morning and letting in the light. Now, who would have believed you were capable of that? You'd be surprised what I'm capable of where Tina's concerned. <laughs> yes. Well, we won't go into that too deeply. Why ever not? I only said you'd be surprised what I was... Ca Let's change the subject. <laughs> You'll have to change it with less of a jerk if she mentions Michael Crane. Well, don't worry, I will. I'm not worried now. You've got plenty up your sleeve. This is the joy for every bit. That'll make her day. Well, seeing her will make mine. Even if it is only... In you go, Tina. Oh, thanks. Hello. Hello, darling. Hello, Tina. <laughs> Hello, Psyche. Tony was just putting the car away as I came in the gate. Yes, and now I'm going upstairs to freshen up. That being the best excuse I can think of for leaving you and David alone. Well, I think I'd better get back to the kitchen. Good thinking all round. I'm afraid I can't stay long, darling. Oh, that's all right. Just seeing you has made my day, Joy. Have you got time to sit down? I've certainly got time to hear about Joy. Hmm? Joy who? Oh, gosh, I see what you mean. I called you Joy. Yes, you did. Oh, that's simple enough to explain. I was thinking of a line I quoted to Anne. What was that? A girl like Joy is a beauty forever. <laughs> uh, it's pretty plain you've got her on your mind. It happened to be you I had in mind, oddly enough. So what did you mean to say? That you're a plain thing and forever odd. <laughs> it's plain you'll be forever simple-minded. Honestly, I go from bad to worse. I have noticed. All I'm trying to say, believe it or not, is that you reminded me of Keats. Wasn't he a man? <laughs> reminded me of something he wrote. Oh, what in particular? A masculine woman is a joy for us. <laughs> That's it. That's my last words. I don't know who first said silence is golden, but I bet they had me in mind. <laughs> but it doesn't matter with you, does it? You understand me. I love you. Oh, now that. That's made my week. <laughs> I love you too, darling Joy. Oh. <laughs> Never mind. I'll change my name by deed poll. It'll be easier. Darling. Mm. Oh, gosh. I can't think of a single thing to say after that. Mm. You'll be glad to know. Is that clock right, honey? Uh, I mustn't be late for Mr. Crane. Yeah, according to my subject, it's five minutes change. <laughs> uh, five minutes slow. According to your watch? Yes, but don't go by that. He's inclined to be fast. He? It. It doesn't really matter. Mr. Crane will... Oh, by the way, Tina. Sorry to interrupt, but there's something I simply must say. A second ago, you said you couldn't think of a single thing. I know, but I'll have to now. <laughs> I have to say this now, leave it till later, and I might forget. Say what? Um, that, um... Forgotten already? No, no, of course not. What then? Well, just give me a moment. I'll sort out what I've got left. <laughs> I'll sort out my thoughts and tell you what I left unsaid. I know I had it on the tip of my sleeve. You know, <laughs> had it up my cuff. I had something to say. Now, let's see, what was it? Um... Have I, have I told you you're not pretty or attractive like any of my other girlfriends? No, and I trust you won't. Why? Oh, oh gosh, I see. I, I left out the just, didn't I? Not just pretty or attractive like the others. Meaning I've got something extra? Yes, and you're different too. 
different from anybody else I've ever known. I am? Rounder altogether. Um, <laughs> so that's what you meant by something extra. Different all round. Yourself, in fact, a com- complete jerk. A uh, complete... <laughs> You wouldn't, by any chance, be worried about my interview. Not even vaguely. Not even about who it's with? Well, of course not. Why should I be worried about Michael Sard? After all... Michael who? The Marquis de Crane. Um... (laughs) Michael Crane. Michael Crane. After all, interviewing people like him is a sensual part of your job. (laughs) Sensual? And essential. It did sound a bit like sensual there, didn't it? Very like. I also know that to you, interviewing him is like interviewing any other animal. No, a monster. Frankenstein. Jealousy. The green-eyed monster. Yes, but it, it isn't that I don't trust you. It's just that, well, it's a bit difficult to explain. You're sure of me. Lack confidence in yourself. Well, not as difficult as I thought. Don't let it get a hold on you, honey. It could prove dangerous. I know. That's what Anne said. And it makes sooth, too. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> Which is more than you ever do. Must fly, darling. I'll see you to the door. <laughs> yes, okay, come on. When do I see you next? Uh, tomorrow night. I'm fine for me. Here about seven. Marvellous. And I won't have to put you off this time. Well, let's hope not. Here, I'll open the front door for you. Well, watch it, won't you, darling? What Anne said made good soup. Bye. See you tomorrow. Yes, right up. Hope the interview goes well with Michael Manchu. Um, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> I know. Ought to be thankful I got away with it. <laughs> and I am. There's no need to ask you if everything went smoothly. I can see it written all over your face. I only wish I could say the same about myself. I behave like a proper Charlie. <laughs> Well, jealousy can make Charlies of us all. Which reminds me. What? I wonder if Tony knows about Clive's new car yet. It's no good. You'll never convince me about that. Why, good gracious, you and the Howards have been friends for as long as I can remember. So? Well, Tony's not likely to be jealous of Clive having a new car. You wouldn't say that if you'd heard him on the subject of their new stereo radiogram. Well, you've got a stereo set too. And yours is bigger than theirs. That's why we've got it. It had to be bigger than theirs. (laughs) Seriously? The green-eyed monsters had a direct effect on the size of practically everything we own. We can't afford a new car, though, so bitterness is bound to set in. And we'll know the moment it does by Tony's opening remark. Why? What'll he say? I'm the last person to say anything against old Clive. But. But. Then he'll start gently knocking him. Gently? The new car rates the full carpenter treatment. He'll cut Clive down to size by saying he's had more than his share of luck, including having his house bought for him by his father-in-law. Chip away at his success by saying that he was only made a director of his firm because one of the other directors happens to be a relation of his. It was the other way round as it happens. Then hammer away at him for being ostentatious. You know, Clive can't wait to tell you what he's bought or what it costs, and that's something I can't stand. And so on and on and on. How do I cope with it if he mentions it to me? Well, just go with the wind and wait till it blows itself out. And... Alexander wants you to go up and say goodnight. Yes, all right. A future Prime Minister needs his sleep. (laughs) Tina's gone then, David? A minute or two ago. Nice little car she's gone. By kind courtesy of the magazine. Oh, her too, eh? What's the worst of being like me, a one-man business? You'll have to buy your own car. No, make do with the one I've got. I believe old Clive Howard even gets his cars bought for him by the company. Oh, you have heard about it then? Heard what? That he's got a new car? No. Oh, dear, haven't you? No. I wouldn't have mentioned it if I'd known. (laughs) Sorry. Why sorry? Why sorry? Um, well, because I know you'd like one yourself. Yes, <laughs> you don't seriously think that would make me jealous of Clive F. One, do you? No, no, not for a moment. I hadn't heard about it, actually, but I soon will. Take it from me, I soon will. I'm the last person to say anything against old Clive. But. But what? No, I thought you were going to knock something, sorry. They were going to say something. I expect you're wondering how the knock got into that. Oh, fascinating. I, I thought Psyche was going to knock that occasional table over. <laughs> Uh, oh, yes, you were. Near enough. Sorry, Tony. You were about to knock something. Uh, say something. Only that Clive's been unusually lucky, eh? Ah, no, I agree with the wind there. I agree with you there. I expect you're wondering how the wind got in. <laughs> Probably through the hole in your head. More than likely. Well, seriously, though, Clive has been lucky. To put it mildly. Not that I've got a chip on my shoulder about it. Well, of course not. You're not that sort of carpenter. Carpenter. Um, <laughs> not that sort of chiseler. A uh, person. I expect you're wondering what all that was about, too. That's the least you can expect. Yes, well, Anne and I were talking about... about buying Alexander a model carpentry set. Mind you, I think she's got a point. Meaning what? That he might cut himself down to size. I might cut his, um... With the clues thick on the ground. Carpenter, chiseler, <laughs> cut down to size. It's not difficult to work out what's been going on. You and Anne, carving me up as usual. I say that's rather neat, carving you... No, 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 no. I didn't say a word about you. Dinner, sir. 
A tear space on the table, David. Oh, and Tony, something's gone wrong with the kitchen tap. I can't turn it off. You've got the same trouble with your brother. <laughs> well, don't be long, darling. I don't want everything to go cold. I already have. Implying? That as far as you and David are concerned, winter has set in. Have you ever thought of having him lagged round the mouth? <laughs> Tell me, I can guess. You slipped up and let him know that I said he was jealous of Clive. I'm terribly sorry, Anne. Oh, well, never mind. Let's put it down to you being upset about Tina. I wish I was as many-headed as jealousy. Why? Well, I might have one that worked. Michael Crane phoned here. And asked me for Tina's number. And you gave it to well, him? I didn't know what to do. Well, I would have done. What time did he ring? About five minutes ago, wasn't it, Tony? No, about then. Well, that settles it. Something's going on between them. Something is definitely going on. And it doesn't take a genius to guess what. Fortunately. Well, I'm sure there's a simple explanation, David. Well, of course there is. Something's going on, and I intend to find out what. Not that I need to. It's only too obvious. I'm not completely green. No, it's a fine line. <laughs> I can't, I can't wait to hear what story she'll trump up when I confront her with it. She, she'll cook up something, though. Deception obviously comes easily. It's all right, I'll answer it. Anne Fellows? Uh, hello, Anne. Tina, could I speak to David? Yes, hold on, Tina. I'll, um, I'll just see if I can find him. See if you can find me. I wanted to give you a chance to calm down. Stands to reason she's rung up to put me off yet again. Now, look, you don't want to lose her altogether, do you? Well, no, but... Then act naturally. Are you sure that's good advice? Well, just be your subhuman self. Now, not a word about Mr. Crane or about him phoning, clear? Perfectly. Calm enough? Completely. Phone. Thanks. Hello, Tina. Calm here. <laughs> Hello, darling. Sorry to have kept you holding on, only Anne was just briefing. They're just <laughs> breezing around looking for me. How are you, darling? We're just fine. And you? We're just abnormal. <laughs> usual. Look, honey, I I'm pushed for time, so all I'll say for the moment is that I'm terribly sorry. I'm not surprised. I haven't told you why yet. I know, but even I can put one and one together. David. Yeah, not, 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 not that I mind, of course. What did you mean by putting one and one together? Nothing, really. Only we've just had a phone call from Mr. Cr from a mysterious crank. When? When? About five Michaels ago. Minutes. <laughs> Tonight, after all, David, I'm rushing off to another interview. I'm sorry, but there it is. No, don't be silly. It's all right. After all, trumping up interviews is part of your job. Trumping up interviews? Oh, cooking up people. They're interviewing cannibals. Um, Tomorrow being Saturday, I could call around in the morning. Ten o'clock, all right for you? Yes, fine. I'll explain everything then. Goodbye. Goodbye, Tina. All right, so I messed it up, and I couldn't care less. She thinks she's very clever, but it's palpably obvious she's running off to that animal crane. But did she say so? No. No, no, she did not. She left it vague. Said she was rushing off to another interview without, note, without saying who with. Adding that she'd explain everything in the morning. Giving herself plenty of time to think up a good story, of course. Well, she's wasting her time, because from now on, she is, as far as I'm concerned, an ex-girlfriend. And I'd hate to tell you what ex equals. They say losing your temper is good for the adrenaline glands. I've got enough anger building up inside me to keep my adrenaline glands fighting fit for the rest of my life. And not a thing to go on. What about not mentioning she was going round to see that animal? Well, you can't be sure she is. Well, of course she is. He phones and asks for her number. She phones and puts me off. That's too much of a coincidence. I'm surprised at you for taking her side. Well, don't just stand there. Tony, say something. I'd feel the same if I was in David's place. Forget I spoke. Just stand there. <laughs> What time is she coming round in the morning? Ten o'clock. Well, then the least you can do is to wait till you've had a chance to talk to her tomorrow. Wait till tomorrow? A couple more minutes and he'll have convinced himself they're having a full-blooded affair. What's more, if I was in his shoes... I've told you once, just stand there in your own shoes. <laughs> Look, I've got a better idea. You, you haven't been to the clubhouse since we had the restaurant built on, have you, David? What, your golf club? Yeah. Well, no. Well, well you, you, you can have a pretty good nosh up there, you know. And, well, I don't know whether I've mentioned it to you, but I was recently elected a member of the committee. <laughs> haven't mentioned it to David. You stopped strangers in the street and told them. <laughs> Treating that with the disdain it deserves. How about you and I, David, having dinner there? Eh? Well, that's very kind of you, Tony. Having dinner out when I've spent hours slaving over a hot stove. Why, what have we got? Cold lamb and salad. <laughs> oh, no. I think it's a wonderful idea. Well, so do I, except that I doubt if I'll be very good company. Oh, I'll risk that. How about it, eh? It'll only take me about five minutes to check. That's about the kindest gesture I've ever known, but I doubt if it'll be much help. Oh, what's got into you today? Well, if I'm right, and I'm certain I am, this is the fourth interview in succession Tina's had with old King Sensuality. So? She's writing an article about him, not compiling an encyclopedia. 
Not that I blame him entirely. You said jealousy might turn me into a monster. Why, well, he's one already. A complete Dracula, feeding on the girls, ensnared by his fame. But I would have thought that Tina, of all people, would have... David Bliss? Hello? Hello, it's Tina again. I'm phoning from a call box. I know, I heard the pips. You better give me your number in case I have to ring you back there. Oh, no point, honey. I'm in too much of a hurry. In every sense. Now, what do you mean by that? Nothing. I rang up to say I might just be able to pop in later on this evening, if you think it'll be any use. Yes, all right. But I can't promise. You understand? Only too well. I know what you meant by that. Saves me explaining, then. I'm not going to count ten. No, you're going to count Dracula instead. <laughs> if I'm coming, I say if. It'll be around half past eight. Goodbye. Goodbye. I've never seen anything like it since Jekyll and Hyde. She's going to try to get round, isn't she? Yes. Because she doesn't want you worrying. And you reward her with a cheap joke about Dracula. Well, she deserved it. I'm going to get so hopping mad in a minute. You take your turn in the queue. <laughs> Don't you see what's happened? She's on her way to Michael Crane's. Starts thinking back over our first phone conversation, realizes I've twigged what... Look, you're going to have to stop your flights of fantasy now. We've got another problem coming up fast. Tony. Busily changing. Oh, I'm sure you'll understand. Don't count on it. At a guess, he'll advise you to leave her a curt little note saying that you've decided to go out to dinner. Well, what would I gain by that? There's a well-known gambit in the battle of the sexes. You feign indifference. Your partner faints into your arms. Does it work? It wouldn't with Tina. And Tony knows that it wouldn't. Then why would he suggest it? Well... No, no, not, not the old G.E.M. Short for... Green-eyed monster. Yes, in a sort of way. Oh, come now. Tony jealous of Tina? Put out, hurt, call it what you like, but yes. He thinks of himself as a tough man of the world, but he's really a very sensitive plant. He is? Crossed with a cactus. <laughs> a prickly pear, in fact. Easily bruised, though. I don't see what you can do about it, either, unless... Yes, of course that's the answer. I'll take his side. Whatever he says, whatever he advises you to do, I'll side with him, okay? Well, if you think it'll do any good. Finest tonic for any man. What? Letting him think he's in the right. Well, how do I react, though? Well, pretend to dig your heels and then get really stubborn. What? Say something like, um, I've decided to stay in in the hope of seeing Tina and that's all there is to it. Or something even stronger. I couldn't care less what either of you think. My mind's made up and that's final. I think you're being very stupid, David. Why? Was that too strong? No, that's what I'll say when oh, you... Oh, when I throw my temperament. I get the idea now. Let, let's run through it again. No, there's no time. Just see that you put up a better performance than usual. Well, don't worry. I'll give it the full prima donna. But start by saying how sorry you are, right? Oh, I couldn't be sorrier. And it couldn't have been a kinder gesture. Only, well, if Tina is... Ready in four minutes flat. Not bad going, eh? I must say I'm looking forward to it. I can't go after all, Tony. Can't go? Tina phoned to say she might be able to pop in later. I see. Oh, I couldn't be more sensitive, honestly, Plant. Um, you what? I couldn't be sorry, I prickly. I'll get it right if it kills me. You'd better, or I'll do it myself. I couldn't be sorry, I bruiser. Um, and it, um, oh, for goodness sake, David, what are you trying to say? How sorry I am. And I am, Tony. It couldn't have been a kind of cactus. <laughs> a kind of act. Us was just talking about it. Many's the time I've been convinced you'd achieved the ultimate in muddles. Once again, I'm proved wrong. Could we hack our way through the jungle? It was a very kind gesture, and I feel badly about letting you down. Oh, my dear chap, don't give it a second thought. As long as you know what you're doing? Yes, I, I know what I'm doing. Waiting in on the off chance of seeing her? I'm not sure that's wise, are you, darling? Wise or not, my mind's made up. That's plain stubborn. Yes, well, this is one time when I'm going to dig my heels in. Well, I think you're being very stupid, and I'm sure... I couldn't it. care less what either of you think. Unwise, stupid, and stubborn it may be, but I am not going to leave her a curt little note saying I had to go out, and that's final. Who said anything about leaving her a note? <laughs> you did, didn't you? No. <laughs> You didn't? No. You did. Oh, so that's who it was. I, I had a feeling that's what you were going to suggest, but it wouldn't work. Not with Tina. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, that old gambit in the battle of the sexes. I feign indifference, you feign into my arms. <laughs> Tina faints into your arms. Mine. Now, she'd never fall for it. Yeah, you may be right at that. It's no use arguing, Tony. My mind's made up. Tony wasn't arguing. And it's no use taking his side, either. I wasn't. If anything, we're both agreeing with you. Yes, well, I don't happen to agree with either of me. <laughs> I have got a mind of my own, strange as it may seem. It's always seen that. 
to you, perhaps, but I'm still entitled to my opinion, and nobody's going to change it. Not you, or Anne, or anybody else. Heaven knows I don't often throw a temperament, but I'm going to give such a hopping performance in a minute. I'm going to get so hopping mad. I think perhaps I'd better go into the other room and wait for Prima in there. Prima? Um, Tina. She's my girlfriend, it's my life, and for once, just for once, I'm going to do what I like with her. It goes without saying that you put him up with it. Well, only because I didn't want you to feel hurt. No, I hadn't say, do you, do you really think that I'm such a sensitive plant? I think you're sensitive. How quickly could you get changed? In about a quarter of an hour, why? I was just thinking. What? Well, if we're going to have a row, we may as well have it in the clubhouse restaurant. <laughs> So you're on your way then? Yes, Anne was ready in double time. Well, don't you mean double quick time? No, double the time she said you'd take. <laughs> Are you sure you don't mind being left on your own, Poppy? Good heavens, no. That may be Tina now. Well, doubt it. It's not even eight o'clock yet. Now go. I've got to get the car out anyway. If it is Tina, David, don't start making any wild accusations. Mention Michael Crane. No, you don't have you... to brief me. I have made up my mind. A poor thing, but mine own. But I'm going to do it my way. And that's by far the best way, I suppose. Hello. Oh, oh, oh there was you. Hello, Tina. Uh, has Tony told you when, that you're going out to dinner? We'll probably see you when we get back. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. How did the interview go, darling? Uh, very well. Oh, jolly good. Let's sit down, shall we? Uh, aren't you going to ask me anything about it? No. Why not? Because I trust you. And you don't even want me to tell you who it was with? No, not even Michael's name. Uh, mention his name. I tried to see him four times altogether. Once... Oh, you don't have to tell me. I trust you implicitly. Once at the studios, three times at his home. Tonight, I finally made it. He showed me all over the house, too. It's an enormous place. Ridiculous, really. What? Well, having a house that size and, and living all alone. You should see his, his bedroom. Big, big as a dormitory. And as for his bed... All right, all right, I, I get the message. All that poppycock about only seeing him once, you didn't expect me to swallow that, did you? Well, now I've got a couple of things to tell you. Oh, what? I trust you implicitly and I was putting on an act. You had me completely fooled. Yes, I did, didn't I? <laughs> Success at last. My second tonight, actually. Second? I also got the green-eyed monster under control. Not easily, mind, but I really got to grips with it. Then I, I envy it. Now, how do you mean? How do you think? Oh, gosh, oh, I see. Darling, darling, Tina. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, after that, well... What? Who's Michael Crane? That was The Night of Bliss, with George Cole as David Bliss, Brenda Bruce as Anne Fellows, Colin Gordon as Tony Fellows, Muriel Pavlo as Tina Holliday, and Percy Edwards as Psyche. A Life of Bliss is written by Godfrey Harrison and produced by Edward Taylor.